Hi everyone, my name is Chloe Mistagi. I'm the VP of Strategy over at Point3 Security. And I'm looking forward to doing this quick talk for you. Um, I hope you're enjoying the Africa Cyber Defense Forum. Um, I'm gonna turn off my camera so I can focus on my slides, but um, I just want you to know ahead of time, this is a completely gamified talk. So have a piece of paper out, some pen, or you have notes open on your computer, but this is interactive, so hopefully you'll have fun with it, and, and I hope you enjoy it. So I'm gonna turn off my screen, and by screen, I mean my camera. All right, and let's start sharing here. Okay, let's do this. All right, well, once again, welcome back to Africa Cyber Defense Farm. It is a pleasure to be here, and I am so proud of Point3 for being part of it and for helping with the CTF as well, but also if you had a chance to catch my uh, CEO uh, basically yesterday on the panel, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I also want to let you guys know that you might see some common points that he made in this presentation because those data points are important. So let's get going. So welcome to the Hacker Hippo Campus Talk. And we're going to talk about gamification within InfoSec. Now, this once again is a game by talk, so be ready for plenty of fun things to do. In the meantime, um, about myself, I'm the VP of Strategy over at Point3 Security. Um, and one of the other things that I do is that I am the founder of Women Hackers. We're a virtual online uh, platform that basically provides for women and non-binary hackers to hack at all levels. We have workshops and so on. Um, when I'm not doing that, I also run a podcast called ITSP Magazine um, with my colleagues, Alyssa Miller and Phil Wiley. We talk about the most, I guess, everyone's journeys of getting into InfoSec. It's very unique and different in the feedback and takeaways. When I'm not doing that, I'm also the co-founder of WUSEC. Uh, which is a woman of security and we have some chapters all over the world and we even have one in Nairobi so if you're interested let me know I can definitely connect you to our organizer um, last but not least um, for those that are not aware of point three and what we do we basically are a platform that provides uh, training uh, but also it's gamified and uh, you go through educational modules to up your skills on your security team and so it's, it's really fun and we make it gamified because we know that that's how you learn and you learn faster that way. And in this talk, you'll hear a little bit more about the platform and what it can do for you. But just overall gamify how you learn better that way. So what we're first gonna do is the history of gamification. Um, I have to admit, this is the driest part. Uh, because I'll be going through a bunch of different data and everything with you. Uh, but if you pay attention, um, that's where you will have something possibly to learn from it. Um, because like I said, this is completely gamified, so you have to stay on your toes. Um, we'll definitely dive into how our brains are stimulated by it. And then lastly, why gamification helps security teams. And then last but not least, how gamification has transferred lives. So gamification, what is it exactly when we hear this term? But basically it's just games that work on problem solving, processing speed and attention span and memory. Now let's go into the history of gamification. Like I said, this is the driest part, but you have to stay at the edge of your seat so you can know what's going on. So in 425 BC, Dice games were created to fight major famine. And in 3100 BC, the first board game was created in Egypt. S&H Green Stamp um, was the first time ever marketers sold stamps to retailers who used them to reward customers. In 1958, the first video game was invented. And Charles Cardo uh, found a consulting firm called The Game of Work and brings feedback loops found in sports into the workplace. And MUD1 is created by Roy Trubshaw at Essex University. It was the first multi-user virtual world game. 
Thomas Malone publishes What Makes Things Fun to Learn, a study of interestingly motivating computer games. And in 1981, the first ever 3D video games were released. American Airlines was the first one to introduce a Advantage. It was the first frequent flyer program. And Holiday Inn saw, hey, why aren't we doing something like this? So they launched their first hotel loyalty program. And of course, then you have the car rental industry that's like, why aren't we doing this? So then the National Car Rental launches their first ever car rewards program. And by this time, 30% of American households own an NES, and a new generation of gamers is born. Now, Richard Bartle publishes Who Plays MUAs, which divides video game users into four unique types. And in 22, I mean, uh, 2002, Serious Gaming Initiatives forges a link between the gaming industry, training, health, education, and public policy. 2003, Nick Pelling coins the term gamification. And 2007, Bunchball created Dunder Mifflin Infinity, a gamified website for the TV show The Office. It receives over 8 million page views in six weeks. 2009, Quest to Learn accepts a class of sixth graders into a game-based learning environment. And in 2010, DevHub adds a point system to its website and increases user engagement by 70%. Gamification Co. in 2010 holds the first gamification summit in, guess where? San Francisco, of course. And in 2012, 45,000 enroll in a Professor Kevin Warbach's online gamification course through Coursera. And last but not least, Mozilla Open Badges Initiative is launched. The open source badge can be seen as a mark to accomplishments online. And in 2012, Gartner predicts, believe it or not, you ready for this? 70% of global 2000 organizations will have at least one gamified application by 2014. And in 2014, M2 Research predicts that gamification will be a $2.8 billion industry by 2016, which is true, but it went way beyond that. It's actually expected to become $11 billion industry by 2020, which is right now. So let's see if it meets it. Now, I hope you guys remember that was a lot of information and I know it's super dry, but if you pay attention, you'll get these answers right. So first question for you. What year did the first video game come out? Hmm, think about that. What year did the first video game come out? 1958. Next question. What country invented the first board game? What country invented the first board game? It was Egypt. What airline did the first frequent flyer program? Anyone know which airline did the first frequent flyer program? American Airlines. Who coined the term gamification? Who coined the term gamification? Nick Pelling. That one's a hard one, I know. Nick Pelling, it's always the hardest one. What was the gamified website by Bunchball for the TV show The Office called? What was the gamified website by Bunchball for the TV show, The Office Called? Dunder Mifflin Infinity. All right. Gamification is expected to become a what billion dollar industry by the end of 2020? So gamification is expected to become a what billion dollar industry by the end of 2020? 11 billion. All right, and a pop quiz, or maybe this is a trick. Well, we don't know. It shall be a mystery, but let's dive right back into the presentation now. And yes, if you were a fan of Monty Python, yes, that is a Monty Python picture right there. 
All right, but the fact is always is that InfoSec has always been gamified. I mean, think about it. CTFs, hackathons, bug bounty, many of us became hackers to beat games and to be better than our peers who were better than us. We found cheat codes and other methods for doing so. But most importantly, when we hunt for vulnerabilities, it's a game of how far does this foxhole go? It's the constant, how can I outsmart this and that? And yes, of course, there's gonna have to be another one. So this is an InfoSec timeline. So on October 10th, 1995, Netscape launches the first ever cash reward for finding security bugs in the Netscape Navigator 2.0 beta. Something to know about this is that because of that, that's how bug bounty programs started getting formed. Um, and that means like Google, Facebook, those started happening too. Um, so it's really fascinating because Netscape really set the scene for what is what we now call a bug bounty program. But before the company started doing their own bug bounty programs after Netscape, there was the DEF CON for CTF, which was in 1996. Um, now, bug bounty programs were created and managed by companies such as Google, Facebook, and Mozilla. However, what happened was that they also didn't really know how to do it better. Um, and so think about it that way is that they started doing it themselves and then they realized you have to have a dedicated team, a dedicated manager to help with that, which was one of the starting points of how Bug Crowd, HackerOne, and Synac came about because they were the birth of the bug bounty platforms starting in 2012 to 2013. Um, so this is a really important thing to note is that uh, bug bounty started from Netscape because they did this one example and it turned out very well that companies started to do it themselves and then they realized that they also need help. So these middle men, I hate using that term, but um, basically uh, bug bounty companies platforms, what they do is they connect hackers to companies in a legal way for them to submit bugs and get paid out on it. Um, and yes, there are times where you don't get paid out on it. You get thank yous and swag instead, but still it's a, it's the first step forward for companies to trust hackers when it comes to disclosing, um, their vulnerabilities so then they can fix it and patch it. Uh, now, Pond to Own, I know I skipped over it, but it started in 2007. Um, but last but not least, it was really because of bug bounty programs, CTFs, um, and hackathons. They themselves started showing more and more evidence that gamified way of going through your security is the right way how to do it you learn a lot faster. Think about it, if you're a bug bounty hunter, you wanna know the latest tools and resources out there. So what are you gonna do? You're gonna learn everything possible and then apply it. And so gamified training, like educational modules, these things started being a necessity for companies. So a lot of companies, they use Point3 security to help train their security team members so it fills in the skills gap because you can know what are the weaknesses and strengths of their team now um, by using the platform and by knowing that, then you know what you need to do next on your team and making sure that your team stays safe and secure and also that no one gets burned out by not knowing enough. So it's a good way to learn things because I don't know about you, but I don't really remember things that I read in my textbook. I usually will remember if it's something that I'm, I'm actually capable of using it so then I can remember and recall. And it's back, another round of the pop quiz time. Woo, all right. So the first bug bounty program was created in which year? Does anyone remember the first bug bounty program? When was it created? What year? 1995. Thank you, Netscape. When was the first CTF at DEF CON? When was, what year was that? 1996. And the fin of the pop quiz time. But let's, but it's not over yet. Trust me, there's a bunch of other gamified activities throughout this talk. Um, but let's first dive a little bit about how your brains are stimulated by it. So what I want you to do is I want you to take a look at that green part of the brain on the left side, the temporal lobe, 
we're going to be focusing on that um, because those pop quiz questions were actually stimulating the green section, taking new material and then applying it uh, currently. And because of that, that is happens near temporal lobe. Um, and we're going to dive into that area the most because that's where gamification thrives. Now, if you see on the right side, the amygdala and hippocampus, they're both within the temporal lobe and we will be going into those two as well. So temporal lobe, let's get a little bit into that one. So the temporal lobe is involved in processing sensory input into derived meanings for the appropriate retention of visual memory, language comprehension, and emotion association. It is where gamification thrives and is where the amygdala and hippocampus are. And of course, there's an activity. All right, you ready for this, everyone? Here we go. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna read a description out, a one-line description, and you guys have to guess what I'm describing. All right, you ready? Here we go. A plant having a permanently woody main stem, usually growing to a high height and developing branches at the same distance from the ground. What is it, you guys? It's a tree. Next one. The nutritious orange to yellow root of a plant of the parsley family. Carrot. An article of furniture consisting of a flat top supported on one or more legs. Table. An institution where instruction is given. School. A moving cage for carrying passengers from one level to another. Elevator. Yeah, I'm, there. I'm always going to now think of an elevator as a moving cage now. <laughs> All right. A device for transmission of sound or speech to a distant point. I know this one's tricky, so I'm going to read it one more time. A device for transmission of sound or speech to a distant point. It's a phone. All right. A body of water of considerable size surrounded by land. So a body of water, considerable size, surrounded by land. What is that? A lake. All right, a domestic fowl bred for its flesh, eggs, and feathers. What is this? A domestic fowl bird for its flesh, eggs, and feathers. Chicken. A shallow, usually circular dish from which food is eaten. What is it? A shallow, usually circular dish from what food is eaten. It's a plate. A precipitation in the form of ice crystals. Snow, right. All right, now this one's a hard one, so I'll read it twice. Any circulating medium of exchange. Any circulating medium of exchange. It is money, believe it or not. All right, you guys did well. All right, so what I want us to understand here is that the amygdala and hippocampus play a huge role within the temporal lobe. Now, the amygdala controls your emotional responses and helps your brainstorm memories. It also works closely with the hippocampus. The hippocampus plays a role in your memory, your navigation, and emotional response. So what happened right there in that activity, it was uh, basically, it was bringing back memories and putting a visual um, to a definition. So the definition is being read and your hippocampus is thinking of, okay, what is it? What, what image am I getting from this description? Um, and usually the things that we remember from our memory is because there's some sort of emotional charge with it, right? So say for example, at school, we have an emotional charge with it. So when I read the definition of a school, you probably had that idea of, okay, I see a building and it's bringing back also emotional memory to trigger it. So your emotions play really well with your memories and it's very hard to have any memories without an emotion tied to it. 
All right, so let's dive a little bit into the hippocampus. So this is where the short-term memories in the hippocampus are transferred to long-term memories into the temporal lobe. Our conscious memories are formed by the hippocampus by taking a snapshot of a short-term working memory and committing it to a long-term memory stored within the temporal lobe. So we're gonna do another activity. Now what I want you to do is to read this list to yourself twice in, a, in the same order. And I'll give you guys a little bit of time to do so. So you wanna read this over twice. All right. Next step, you ready? Here we go. So this is what I want you to do. I want you to draft an email or pull up notes app, or better yet, what you can do is write down the objects in order that they appear um, right now, because that's what you're gonna be doing. You want to try to get as many of those in the particular order, and if you don't remember the order, that's okay. You just wanna remember as many of those items. Um, and in order if you can. Um, so you, can, you have two minutes to complete this task, so I'm gonna set my timer now. All right, and go. instincts and memory. Now I know you can't control it, only the prefrontal uh, part of your brain can. It's completely subconscious. Now to note about it, it's also the fear versus flight mechanism. So for example, if you're told at a young age to be afraid of spiders and snakes, you'll be triggered and you'll know to be away from spiders and snakes because there's a memory and there's emotion attached to it for survival mechanism. Um, so just note about that. Now you're probably wondering, what does the amygdala have anything to do with it? Well, because your emotions are attached to your memories, um, this is how you learn. And also this is how you can improve on your memory. And I'm gonna show you why. So we're gonna do a quick little activity. I'm hoping that you can hear the sound. All right, here we go, you guys. So pay attention to this video. Watch this series of images very closely. Ready? Go. Do you recall seeing any shoes or keys? Probably not. At this speed, 80% of the people we showed this to don't see either the shoes or the keys. We'll slow it down. Did you see them this time? You probably did. Now, we're going to play a different scene. All right, how many of you guys saw the shoes and keys? Now, a good percentage of you probably do. And the reason for that is because you work with an infosec. If you are um, someone who's highly detailed oriented, then you're going to catch those things. But most of the population would never catch the shoes and the keys. Now, we're going to go to the second part now out being biased because biases live and breathe in infosec and other industries for example i could send my resume to multiple different companies and all i have to do is change my name on there into a male's name so instead i would say like corey or cody mistagi and i would have chloe mistagi and i would send both of them in and i would always get a call back if it was they would call for a Corey or a Cody um, because there's still this uh, underlying belief that if you are a woman, uh, chances are you're not 
um, you're not technical enough, you don't have leadership experience enough. And so that's one of the things is biases exist in our world that we live in. And this is one way how to make sure that the human bias doesn't get involved in this process. So then they could get better applicants in without people being discriminated against. And let's be real, we do have a huge skills gap. Like I said, certs aren't enough. I mean, how many of you guys have certifications? Now, how many believe that those certs made you amazing at your job? No, chances are it's because you are amazing. And it's not about the certs at the end of the day, it's about who you are and what you do, and what you contribute to. So think about it. And it's not just that, but we also have a huge skills gap that's prone to burnout and breaches because of it, because we're trying to figure out how to do something, but we don't have the tools nor the resources. And this is an issue. So that's why it's really, really important. If you are a CISO yourself, if you are a director of your security team, it's so important to invest in your people. I cannot tell you this enough because if you don't invest in your security team, you won't have a product anymore. You might not even have a company when it comes to having a breach. Afterwards, when she completed it, she joined a consulting company for about six months within InfoSec. Um, she was a technology consultant, basically kind of like a pen tester. Um, and afterwards, basically, Point3 kept wanting to be like, hey, come join us. So um, they should, they had an opening and was wondering if she would like to join due to her performance on Escalate during boot camp. And, and basically, she works uh, over at Point3. Now, I want this to be a main takeaway here. Uh, she never set out to be a hacker as a goal, um, but if she went through her Google search, web app strategies would show up quite often in her history, and how can one manipulate to change and shape was another thing. So she always had the mindset of a hacker. She just didn't know. Now, Valentina, she lives in Chicago, Illinois. She studied math and computer science. Um, during her time, she uh, had an internship in the physics department. She had to learn very basic coding. Um, and she really liked it, how she can basically, by being able to be able to change things around and have some sort of power over it. Um, but she did get a first job as an economist at the Federal Reserve Bank, but she just, something just didn't sit well. She felt very bored, in other words. Um, she did see that there was this boot camp announced by the mayor of Chicago at the time. And this boot camp was put on by DOD and um, Point3 Securities Escalates platform. Uh, she did apply, she got accepted. And halfway through the six month program, so at three months, she was so good on Escalate that she was hired halfway through it to join um, a security company. Now, her, some of her favorite modules is reverse engineering and exploit development. And similar to Veronica, uh, Valentina never sent out to be a hacker. She didn't know that was something that she can do. However, she was very much wanting to learn more and more about the hacker culture and community after seeing the movie Hackers. She said something about it just drew her to it and she felt like that might be a good place for her. Now, the other thing I want you to know is that I'm always collecting stories of people that have been um, you know, positively impacted by gamification. So if you're a bug bounty hunter or someone who does CTFs or has done educational modules that are gamified to get to where you are in your career, let me know, DM me. My DMs are always open. I love to get other stories. And yes, that is my dog, that is Sherlock. All right, the last pop quiz question. Are you guys ready? Here we go. Which person was inspired by the movie Hackers? Out of the stories that I shared with you, who was the person who was? Valentina. So I just wanna go over the last and key takeaways here. So from stories from brain functioning and history, it's just overall, it's clear that gamification is a necessity. So we can all be superheroes every day. And if you're wondering what, what, what do you mean by superheroes? I mean it. 
all of us who work in InfoSec in some sort of way or fashion, we are doing something that protects loved ones, protects neighbors, protects strangers um, from breaches, from, from basically having a better idea what secure lays for us. So thank you guys. Honestly, I know InfoSec is a challenging industry, but I'm so thankful you guys are in it because we need everyone possible to be able to be there and to help out. Um, here are some resources in case if you're wondering. ITSP Magazine, so the Uncommon Journey podcast is there. The Hacker Book Club as well as the link. Um, so the Hacker Book Club is something that I run um, on the sign. Basically, we read books from the hacker community and the hacker community reads them together. We have meetings every Tuesday at 5 p.m. Pacific time. So if that's something you wanna do, the link is there. I also created an ethical hackers rights petition um, starting at the end of February. And I, I wanted to let you guys know that I've been trying to get as many signatures as possible for it. So if you can share it around, get people to sign it, we need to get rights for hackers. Let's be real, there isn't any right now. And so we need any way to protect our ethical hackers. Last but not least, if you're curious to learn more about Point3 Security, you can always visit our website, which is ittakesahuman.com. I'm more than happy to help out on that front if you have any other additional questions. Um, and if you do have any questions, feel free to DM me on Twitter. Um, my username is, username just, is at just at Chloe Mistoggy.